Well, hello, everybody, and it's happy Valentine's Day. For those who are celebrating Ash Wednesday, too, I know you're coming in later. Miss Hawk and Joss's class, welcome in. Welcome into our YouTube audience as well. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd today, but if you're new to us, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, today, as you will know, we are continuing our epic series in conjunction with the amazing folks at If Then. If Then is an initiative of the Lion Health Philanthropy. It is the single greatest women in STEM celebration showcase in the world ever. They've got 125 amazing ambassadors, women of all stripes from all over the planet that have dedicated their careers to improving science and exploration. We've had uh, deep sea explorers. We've had archaeologists. We've had neuroscientists. It has been such a wild ride this week. And I really encourage our entire audience to check out the If Then page to learn more about the amazing resources that they have showcasing their ambassadors. Now, today, I'm thrilled in our second of a, a triple header broadcast. We just wrapped up with Jessica Taft talking about global health to be joined live in New York by Megan Prescott. She is a microbiologist and a science communicator. I'm a science communicator, so it's kind of fun to have someone on who gets to share the wide and wonderful world of science with a wide audience. But we're going to learn a little bit today about her diverse career, the sort of two-pronged approach that she gets to do in the science realm. So we're going to learn about some microbiology together, learn about some psychom together, have a great time, and learn a lot. Have your trigger fingers at the ready to answer any questions, because I think we've got some interactive bits today. And without further ado, live in New York, Megan, welcome to the broadcast. Hey. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to continue this on. You are like, I think they're smack dab in the middle of this epic 16 part series uh, speaker. So thank you for joining us on Valentine's Day. <laughs> of course. Now, I know you got a lot to share with us. If you want to bring it up, it's always finicky as we go live, but. Yeah, <laughs> let's <laughs> see here. <laughs> Is. It wants to work. It worked two seconds before we went live. Yeah, so I we, know. Yep. Yeah, you are good to go. We're Couldn't be it. better. All right. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here today on Valentine's Day. I'm so excited to be speaking to you all. Um, my name is Megan Prescott, and I'm trained as a scientist and currently work as a scientific event planner and science communicator. I'm originally from Georgia and received my PhD from the University of Georgia in microbiology, where I tried to make a new vaccine for tuberculosis. I also worked at TED conferences where I watched every single TED talk about science and technology. And now you can find me at the New York Academy of Sciences. So to start off this talk today, we're going to start with a question for you all to think about. What do these three images, a vampire, the beach, and ice cream cones have in common. If you have any guesses, put it in the chat. While you think about it, I'm going to introduce you to one of the themes of today's talk, microbiology. Microbiology is the study of all living organisms that are too small to be visible with the naked eye. Micro means small and biology means the study of life. Microbes include viruses, bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoa, prions, and archaea. Because microbes are too small to be seen with the naked eye, you have to use a microscope to study them. And I've spent probably hundreds of hours of my life looking through one as a microbiologist. Microbiology is essential for the study and understanding of all life on this planet. So it's kind of a big deal, no pun intended. The microbes we're going to be focusing on today are bacteria. Bacteria are single celled organisms, unlike humans, which are made up of trillions of cells. The different types of bacteria are classified into five groups according to their basic shape. So they can be spherical, rod-shaped, spiral-shaped, shaped like a comma or corkscrew. They are found in every habitat on Earth, in soil, rocks, oceans, and even in the Arctic snow. Some live in or on other organisms, including plants and animals, and even humans. And there are approximately 10 times as many bacterial cells as human cells in the human body. So you're basically made up of more bacteria than you are human. There are what people consider good bacteria. We have good bacteria living in our body, in our mouth, our nose, our stomach, and on our skin. And I'm sure you've heard the importance of the microbiome, the bacteria and other microbes that live in your gut. All these good bacteria live peacefully within us to keep us healthy. Other good bacteria help make some of the foods we like to eat, like cheese and bread, or even like kombucha and cabbage. And um, they do this through a process that's called fermentation. Another cool bacteria lives inside the Hawaiian bobtail squid. 
to make it bioluminescent and glow in the dark in the ocean. However, there are bacteria and microorganisms that make us sick, and those are called pathogens. I'm sure you're all familiar with COVID-19 and the flu, which are viral pathogens, but things like pneumonia and strep throat are typically caused by bacterial pathogens. And bacteria can spread through the air, through direct contact with a contaminated object, food or water, or from mosquito, tick, and flea bites. But good hygiene practices in modern public health help us avoid getting sick from most pathogens. And if you do get a bacterial infection, you can treat it with antibiotics, or there are vaccines against some bacterial pathogens that can prevent us from getting sick in the first place. Okay, so back to our question. Were there any guesses? Oh, we. I think we confused them. Uh, Edward threw everybody off with the twilight excitement. I mean, these are things that I, I, could, I could eat some ice cream on a beach while watching twilight. For me you personally, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be my first choice necessarily. Oh, yeah, this is a hard question because <laughs> what ties these three things together? I'll tell you, it might not be expected. And that's the fact that they were all <laughs> popularized by tuberculosis. Of course, that? Megan. Yeah, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> tuberculosis is an infection which is caused by a bacterial pathogen. It's most famously known as a lung infection that causes people to cough up blood. Allegedly, the myth of vampires um, came about from the way that people with tuberculosis, um, the way they looked when they were dying. They were pale, they were flint, uh, thin, they had a flushed appearance. And um, that's because we didn't know what tuberculosis was or that it was caused by a bacteria. So people just assume something supernatural. Um, and then because people who have tuberculosis cough up blood, it makes it look like they had just sucked blood from somebody's neck. But later, once we knew tuberculosis was not caused by vampires, but didn't know how to treat it, people were sent to beaches to breathe in the fresh seawater, which was thought to help their lungs. And as for the ice cream, it used to be sold in glass jars called penny licks, where people would literally reuse and lick the same glass as everybody before them. And they caught on that penny licks were not only disgusting, <laughs> but also spreading tuberculosis. So they started making individual ice cream cones. And effects to stop Efforts to stop the spread of tuberculosis have had far-reaching impacts through history, and these are just a few examples. Um, tuberculosis has a history that dates almost as far back as humankind itself. The bacteria that causes tuberculosis, called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, emerged about 70,000 years ago and accompanied the migrations of anatomically modern humans out of Africa. It was found in Egyptian mummies, was described by ancient Greek philosophers as the most common disease of that time period, and it's pictured throughout many paintings and other media. Okay, another question. <laughs> Maybe this one's easier. Um, have you ever heard of tuberculosis? Uh, maybe you've heard it called TB or consumption. And if so, in what context? And there's three choices that people have mm -hmm. um, commonly heard of tuberculosis. They've heard of it, but they don't think it's around anymore. Um, maybe you've heard of it, but it's only in other countries, not your country. Or maybe you just know a character that died from it in a book or TV show. This is a popular way for characters to die. <laughs> it certainly is. My wife's a librarian and she loves Victorian literature and TV does away with like half the characters in those books. Uh, <laughs> Megan, we were talking about this before we went live today. I was literally, this is the first time in the 3000 broadcast history of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants that TV has come up in back-to-back -back programs. Um, so our, our general answer here is that it's not around anymore or it's in other countries. Um, I think our kids might be a little young for the books that they've read, read to have this. But uh, yeah, like certainly when I was a boy, I thought about it as something that had been eradicated or something that you know was back in the 1800s but didn't exist anymore. But I get the sense that's not the case. Yeah, and that's what I always thought too. Um, and also throughout my PhD, whenever I told people I worked on tuberculosis, um, most people would say, hey, like, oh, that's not around anymore, right? And um, I'd have to be like, no, the truth is tuberculosis is very much present and relevant today. So tuberculosis is actually the second leading cause of death in the world from a single infectious pathogen only after COVID-19. And it was the leading cause of death from an infectious disease before the COVID-19 pandemic for many years. Um, a quarter of the world's population is infected with the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And in 2022 alone, 10.6 million new infections happened and 1.3 million people died. 
And these um, primarily occur in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. So how do all these people in the world get tuberculosis? Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria, spreads through the air when a person with TB coughs, sneezes, speaks, or even sings. A nearby person can inhale the bacteria from the air into their lungs, and it's primarily an infection of the lungs, but can spread to the kidneys, spine, and brain. What makes tuberculosis so dangerous for people? Physically, the bacterium itself, pictured in the first um, cartoon picture, it's a rod-shaped bacterium, so in the shapes we mentioned earlier, um, but it has a waxy cell wall that forms a barrier that protects it against most antibiotics. Think about how, like, waxing your shoes can protect it from rainwater. Um, Antibiotic-resistant tuberculosis is a huge problem that affects uh, 400,000 people living with TB. The tuberculosis bacteria can also hide in your lungs in a hibernation state until a person contracts another disease that can wake up the tuberculosis infection. And this is particularly true when somebody has HIV infection. So someone may end up dying of tuberculosis um, as a result of contracting a different disease. And then outside of the bacteria itself causing disease, antibiotic treatment for tuberculosis um, can take up to nine months. And many people don't want to or cannot take medication for that long because the medication itself can make people feel really sick. So because tuberculosis can be deadly and because antibiotic treatment doesn't always work for tuberculosis, my goal during my PhD was to help prevent people from getting tuberculosis in the first place by creating a new vaccine. But if tuberculosis is as dangerous as I just mentioned, where simply breathing it in can cause disease, how do you work with it in a lab? I worked with tuberculosis in what is called a biosafety level three lab, and you have to wear a special high containment suit. And even when you're wearing the suit, you work with the bacteria inside a biosafety cabinet, which is pictured on the right there. And um, that cabinet filters out any contaminated air. And um, here's the video I made showing the process of getting ready to work in the biosafety level three lab. First, you have to put on this plastic jumpsuit um, that keeps liquid out. And then after you put on the jumpsuit, you have shoe covers to protect your feet from anything that might spill on the ground. Then you put on a first pair of gloves that you seal with tape so nothing goes down your sleeve. And then arm covers since your arms will go into the biosafety hood. And then another pair of gloves, a hairnet to keep your hair protected and out of your face. And the belt is a personal air respirator that filters out air. I put in the battery and the hose connects to a hood with a plastic face covering. Imagine sneezing in that face covering. It's not very fun or hygienic. So um, I just mentioned that I worked on a new vaccine for tuberculosis. There is currently a vaccine for TB that some of you in countries outside of the United States might have actually received. However, the vaccine has not been improved since it was first tested in 1921. The vaccine is called BCG and was made at the Pasteur Institute in Lille, France using the closely related Mycobacterium bovis species that um, affects cows, but does not cause disease in humans, but it can protect humans against tuberculosis. The picture on the left is of the original BCG vaccine cultures in the Pasteur Institute in France, which I got to see firsthand, which was pretty cool full circle moment for me. And um, this vaccine has been administered to over 4 billion people worldwide making it the most widely used and the oldest vaccine still used today. So if we have a vaccine for tuberculosis and there are antibiotics, why is it so prevalent and deadly today? Um, that's because TB is mostly found in lower income countries that maybe don't have the most developed healthcare systems and people may not be able to afford or access medicine or even nutrition or healthcare to maintain their health to fight the infection. The technology to diagnose tuberculosis is outdated, slow, and often not accurate. And there's also little investment in aid and research money because TB is not considered a priority by high income countries. For that reason, only two in five people with TB will receive treatment. So <laughs> what can we do about the health crisis that is tuberculosis? The purely scientific approach and the one I always thought was the only way possible was to work in a lab and work on a new vaccine like I did, a diagnostic test or a new antibiotic. But this process is slow and requires years of schooling. One of the other answers is to talk about it. 
And this is where science communication comes in. A recent example of how science communication has aided tuberculosis treatment efforts is from John Green, the YouTuber known for Crash Course and the novelist of The Fault in Our Stars. He created an online campaign talking about the problem of tuberculosis and the inaccessibility of antibiotics for people that need it in low-income countries. Specifically, he called out the pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson for keeping a patent for its TB antibiotic in place, making the drug cost at least $45 per month. This had people who could not afford it using older, more toxic TB drugs that would risk them going deaf or even dying while trying to treat their TB infection. Within days of John Green's campaign, Johnson & Johnson announced that it would make a deal to make the less expensive generic version of their antibiotic available in countries where the rate of TB is high. Um, also, a diagnostic company announced its plans to reduce the cost of tuberculosis testing materials after John Green's advocacy as well. These results are a huge win for people that need to be properly diagnosed and treated for tuberculosis. So uh, we just covered a lot there about tuberculosis in microbiology. To recap, microbiology is essential for studying all life on this planet, including infectious diseases like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is the second infectious leading cause of death worldwide, despite vaccines and antibiotics available to prevent and treat it. Access to healthcare, diagnostics and treatments, and increased funding and research are essential to people living with TB and Vaccines, antibiotics, and advocacy have the potential to improve lives of people with TB. And the good news is that there are quicker and accurate diagnostics um, for TB being rolled out. There are 16 vaccines and 128 antibiotics for the treatment of TB in clinical trials. And there's a shorter one to three month treatment plan being implemented versus the current nine month treatment plan. So there is hope for people living with tuberculosis. So <laughs> that was the tuberculosis focused section of my talk. Um, I'm now gonna go into my specific journey in STEM and how I ended up working with TB. So I grew up outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I majored in biology at Georgia Southern University with a double minor in chemistry and French, <laughs> which we'll come back to later. I did undergraduate research on the distribution of malaria carrying mosquitoes in Southeast Georgia and um, I chose biology because I knew I wanted to do something that helped people. And um, with a dad that works at the Centers for Disease Control and Public Health, science and finding a cure for a disease seemed like the way to do that. So I got my PhD at the University of Georgia in microbiology, where I tried to discover how tuberculosis infects lung cells and use that information to create a new vaccine. I did a fellowship um, right before COVID in the last year of my PhD at the Pasteur Institute in Lille, France, where the first TB vaccine was created. So that French minor came in handy after all, despite what people thought. <laughs> um, however, along the way, I discovered something important about myself in my research career. I did not enjoy doing research as much as I liked talking about the problem of tuberculosis and advocating for solutions to the problem. I also became bothered by the lack of inclusivity in science and the lack of access to good scientific education. So while working on my research, I was president of my university's Women in Science organization to support women in science, including establishing a child care grant for female identifying scientists attending conferences. And I also did outreach with local underserved high schools. Um, I also was extremely bored with the typical ways boys communicated science through Star Wars analogies. So I got really interested in communicating science with art, um, interactive experiences, like convincing people to eat bugs as a sustainable food source at a county fair in New York, <laughs> and um, through fashion design um, and blogging. All of these experiences outside of my PhD research allowed me to get a fellowship at TED conferences um, who do TED Talks. Um, and I was working in science media, learning not just about tuberculosis, but about every topic in science. Like this article I wrote about researchers trying to discover if insects have personalities. The ability to learn about different scientific topics quickly from my experience at TED 
led me to the New York Academy of Sciences, where I plan scientific conferences and events on topics like cancer immunotherapy, artificial intelligence treatments for cardiac diseases, and of course, back to vaccines for respiratory diseases like tuberculosis. I still use the training I received in my PhD, um, just in a different way. And I've met people who know more about science than I do, and they don't even have an advanced degree. Uh, a big perk of my job at the Academy is meeting Nobel Prize winners like Drew Weissman and Catalin Crico, who research led to the COVID-19 RNA vaccines, Jim Allison, the father of cancer immunotherapy, and David Julius, who discovered that the chemical that makes pepper spicy affect pain signaling in the brain. But I also work to give back to my science community by teaching people how to use microscopes at community events around New York City, um, to giving talks like this one today through the IFTN initiative, and also advocating for science funding in Washington, DC. And then People always ask me what I'm holding in my statue picture. Um, and that is a vial of bacteria that I carried to France and back. So that was my way to include microbiology in my statue. Um, I also want to emphasize how important it is to have a life outside of STEM and to always strive to be a well-rounded individual. I enjoy picking up trash in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, exploring New York City, going to sports games, hiking in the snow for the first time in my life as somebody from the South. Um, I enjoy cooking, which is very much like doing lab work and other creative outlets. So um, the lessons I learned in my STEM journey are um, there's no one way to be a scientist. I may not work in a lab anymore, but I still use my science training every day. Um, follow your passion, even if it's unconventional, because it may lead you to places you didn't expect. Have a life outside of STEM and be well-rounded, because you'll be happier for that. And most importantly, use your talents for good. And I just wanted to end today's talk on Valentine's Day by asking you all if you will TB my Valentine. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Megan, that was fantastic. And I want to stress, I mean, I had this privilege of going through the If Then Ambassadors and picking like the coolest, best people. You've done even more than I knew you did. Like that was <laughs> awesome. Um, and I love the bacteria taken to your statue unveiling. That is uh, unique. I think you're probably the only person who took a vial of bacteria to the statue. Oh, so, I am. <laughs> I don't think bravo. they knew or approved of that, but I did it. <laughs> um, we're going to start taking questions soon, but I want to harp on something that you talked about very tangentially in there, because I think it's really important for our kids to know. You talked about one of the initiatives that you did was help get this fund together to allow women to go to conferences. Can you speak to why that's such an important thing and why that was an underserved thing to begin with and why you needed to do it? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, women often take um, the primary child care roles in the family. So um, when it comes time to attend or speak at conferences, if people don't have child care, if they can't afford it, um, then they can't go to those conferences and miss out on opportunities. So that was just one um, small way that we could help even the playing field by allowing people to have access to childcare so they can have these opportunities. That is fantastic. One of my favorite books of the entire year was Invisible Women, uh, which is a, just an incredible read in general and everyone should check it out. Uh, but they talk about that, that sort of in these professional roles, there just isn't the funding to allow people to have that childcare while they go and do things. And it, it really it <laughs> is a, a uh, very big issue, shall we say, for the purpose of this broadcast for kids. Um, <laughs> Megan, uh, for the tuberculosis, vaccines, treatments, everything else, has mRNA started to play a role? A lot of our kids, of course, have heard about this in the COVID context. Um, are we seeing this for TB or other diseases? That is a great question. Um, I have heard inklings of it being used for TB, although I don't know much specifics, but... Um, mRNA is also being trialed for um, cancer vaccines, flu vaccines, um, a ton of other things. I think people saw the success of it and have been trying to capitalize on it. Um, I don't know anything else that's been approved quite yet, but be on the lookout for it. Question from the peanut gallery. As a quick follow-up, as I think our kids really need to know this, uh, cancer vaccines. Cancer is something you can catch? Tell us more. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> um, <laughs> so a cancer vaccine usually it works against your own cancer cells and your own cells in your body and they engineer it to fight the cancer specifically once you have yeah. cancer. So not necessarily to prevent it, but to help treat it once you have it. Right. 
Some of our kids might have heard of HPV, which is something that you can get a vaccine for that can lead to cancers. So I'm really glad we took yeah. the chance to do a little bit of nuance <laughs> on that too. But no, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it does work preventative for, yeah, that's it against a virus that causes cancer. Yes, yeah, so that's the other way that you can use it to prevent cancer. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> oh, no, you're welcome. Yeah, uh, between you and Jessica, I, it's been really nice talking about mRNA because it's one of the most incredible technologies ever. Like it is such a genius way of uh, sort of doing incredible things pretty quickly in an effective and safe way when it comes to creating vaccines all around the world. So you kids are growing up in a time where literally you're going to be in Megan's shoes in the next 10, 15 years where you can contribute to the greatest shift in biomedicine and health ever. Like it is such a, I, my face hurts from smiling just thinking about it, which is a good problem to have. Yeah, so Megan, I promised, I pro oh, sorry. Um, I promised you at the beginning that we were going to get this question and we did. Do you have a favorite part of your job? <laughs> yeah, the favorite part of my job is um, just being able to learn about every scientific topic. When I worked in a lab, although I love tuberculosis, it's like, the huge passion of mine, that's the only thing that I got to work on. So now when I plan conferences or write articles about any scientific subject, there's just so much that I get to learn and know about. Um, and there's when you enjoy science, you enjoy learning. So that's my favorite part to continue learning always. No matter what discipline we've had speakers on in the If Then series, whether they're deep sea explorers or archeologists or health researchers, uh, curiosity, like the excitement of learning, uh, all I'll stress to you kids at your age, go to the library, talk to a librarian who are great at helping you find cool things, read every book, uh, find them, uh, get the chance to look at amazing resources. You talked about Crash Course and John Green. Like, I mean, there's so much out there now. I mean, Megan, even when you and I were coming up, like there was nowhere near the level of exciting information, like conveyed in an incredible way as there is now. So it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, there's so much out there. You don't have to just go check out one library book anymore. <laughs> you can find anything you want. One big encyclopedia and that's yeah. it. The world is your oyster. And you had to get the right encyclopedia. Before yeah. you'd be out of luck. The, inter the internet changed everything back in the good old days. Um, I'm so glad we got this question. It was about the biosafety labs. These are really, really cool places. Um, and there's a few questions around this. What happens if you get infected in a biosafety lab? What do they do to you? <laughs> Whew, well, the whole purpose of working in the biosafety lab is to hopefully not be <laughs> infected. But if you do, I may have had a lab mate who stabbed herself with a needle of tuberculosis. She was fine. <laughs> but um, you have to go to the hospital and get tested to make sure you didn't contract it. And if you did contract something, then you would start treatment right away. Um, and then you would have to review all the safety protocols. <laughs> but it is designed, people would always be like, are you scared to work in there? And the answer is no, because it is designed for you to not get infected. Something has to go horribly wrong for you to get infected. So on this note, and I'm going to have a segue question on this afterwards, you mentioned biosafety level three. Is there like a higher level? What's the deal? How much does it go up to or what's happening? Um, I think it only goes up to biosafety level four. And the different numbers are based on um, if there's a medication or treatment for it. So biosafety level three, um, it's something that is usually airborne like tuberculosis, but there is a treatment for it. So you can be on antibiotics um, and be cured. So biosafety level four would be something um, that there's maybe not a treatment for. So um, that has extra safety precautions um, like external air like in vso3 that we wear the um respirators that filter the air in vso4 i think you have your own air tank so you're not breathing that air at all because if you get whatever that you're working with it would be bad news yeah so at biosafety level four this is what i wanted to harp on as we talked about one of these viruses a minute ago in our last broadcast what kind of things would you be working with in something that's that high level um anything that our kids might know um i think ebola would be biosafety yeah. level for it. Yeah, so we, uh, Ebola, Marburg, like really, really lethal viruses. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have something that can help them. And interestingly, and I think this is still the case, you might know better than I do. To my knowledge, we talked about smallpox in the last broadcast as being one of the great triumphs of humanity is that we wiped out the most lethal disease ever and we got rid of it on planet Earth. But we got rid of it except for, I think, two biosafety level four labs that still have vials of it in case we ever need to know about it, which is a really interesting thing um, anyway, can you speak to that generally? I know it's a bit of a vague question, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. <laughs> yeah, um, 
I think it's biosafety level three, actually. I don't think it's four because we can treat it. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's important to keep socks of it because you never know what's going to come back and you might need to create a new treatment for it based yeah. off um, of the virus itself. Yeah, there you go. I was just curious where you're going to go with that. Cool. Um, <laughs> Megan, in Saigon, you talked about bugs with personalities. Uh, tell us more. I have a personal anecdote about this when I was a kid, but I'm really curious what the research was and what you were able to find. Yeah, so I got to interview um, a researcher. I think, where country is she in? Uh, Finland, maybe? And she does little tests. Like, she'll put cockroaches, where her favorite bugs, through um, mazes and other such tests to see how they act and some of them will go through the maze fine figure it out and some of them like can't be bothered and so she was seeing if she could quantify how they acted to determine if it was a true personality trait or if they were just doing what bugs do and so she was figuring out a way to see if that same bug acted the same way every time and if that's what its personality was it was really interesting when I went in my backyard as a 10 year old, there's this train of ants walking along a rail tie and I put a blade of grass in their way. And like some ants freaked out and ran away and told all the other ants and some walked right over it like it was nothing. And some tried to move it. And it was fascinating to see these creatures that have easy, easy, tiny brains that are, you know, mostly genetically related to one another. And they had these really different approaches to the same problem. And it was fascinating, which is just one of the coolest things in all of animal biology, the, the personalities and thought processes of wildlife. Very, very cool. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds like you're doing similar research to her. <laughs> uh, yes. Back when I was 10 and doing actual science. Um, yeah. See, you can do science anywhere, anytime. anytime. There you go. If you're in grade four, <laughs> grade 10, uh, you can be a scientist too. Just be curious and keep exploring. It's very fun. Mm -hmm. Megan, time flies and you're having fun. So we are nearing the end of the broadcast. I wanted to ask something that I think is really important to anytime we have someone on uh, in biomedical health, which is vaccines. For anyone who's hesitant about vaccines, uh, is there anything that you would tell them to convince them or otherwise? Yeah, I would say that vaccines have been tested for um, hundreds of years. Like the BCG vaccine was made in 1921. That was over 100 years ago. They've been shown to be safe. And what's most important is um, it's better to have the vaccine. You'll have better outcomes if you get the vaccine than if you don't get the vaccine at all. So even if you maybe are a little hesitant, um, you, but you should be informed of what the risks are by a doctor. But even if you're hesitant, it's still safer to have the vaccine than to not have a vaccine for most people. We talked about this in the last broadcast too, and I think it's really important that even if it's a disease that's not likely to kill you, like the flu for me or even COVID for me at this point, you know, I don't want to be sick for a week throughout a year. I miss work. I miss time. I, I put myself at risk of infecting my family and friends and people that might have worse health outcomes. And for the purposes of a free shot that I can go to a local pharmacy and get any time, uh, it's a small inconvenience for something that is so, so beneficial in so many ways. And exactly. as you stress, they're very safe. They're very effective. They've been tested on millions of people, quite literally billions of people in the case of COVID vaccine over the last few years. And we uh, have very firm evidence that it is better to have it than to not have it. So exactly. Megan, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this has been a wild ride through some really cool uh, career options. I, I wanna just take a chance before we wrap up, uh, is there any last message to share with any of our kids joining us live after the fact that you leave them on, on medicine, on science communication, anything you want us to wrap up with? Oh, <laughs> <The pressure>. um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would just emphasize that to do what makes you happy and what you love, because if that's at the core of what you do, then um, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. That would that's it. <laughs> Follow your passion. And this is something that we hear in a lot of our broadcasts. You know, if you're keen on something, keep learning about it. Get more books. Find multiple encyclopedias if you're keen. Talk to people and reach out. I mean, scientists want to share their work. This is true of, of any discipline. If you're interested in history or art, like if you find people that are doing it, most people want to inspire the next generation. So you can go out, get involved, learn more, be an apprentice, whatever. Um, and it can lead to some really amazing things and you can end up as cool as Megan. So uh, take that opportunity, kids, go for it. And thank you so much for joining us as part of this If Then series, uh, ifthenshecan.org for so many more resources to keep the learning going. And with that, Megan, I will say farewell. Have a wonderful rest of the day.